I want to welcome everybody this morning. Beautiful morning out there. Beautiful uh, February morning. Um, this is the Pasco Metropolitan Planning Organization's Thursday, February 9th, 2023. Um, Madam Clerk, could I please have the roll call? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I, yes, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Why don't we all rise for the invocation followed by the pledge? O merciful creator, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the account that we must one day give, may be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I appreciate you keeping me straight on that too. We'll, we'll go with the roll call now. City Commissioner Scott Black? Here. Mayor Scott Tremblay? Councilman Matt Murphy? Here. Commissioner Ron Oakley? Commissioner Catherine Starkey? Here. Commissioner Jack Mariano? Here. Commissioner Seth Waitman? Here. Commissioner Gary Bradford? Chairman Lance Smith? Here. Thank you. Um, if I may, uh, both commissioners um, Oakley and Bradford did uh, send notes ahead of time asking to be excused. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, this is the first uh, time on the agenda where we have public comment, a call for public comment. Do we have anybody that wants to speak to anything? So <coughs> come forward, state your name and address, and we have three minutes. My name is Greg Parsons. I live in Jacksonville. In 2004, I invented the parallel flow intersection, or PFI, one of three built alternatives now in the F.4154 pd &E study, two with bridges and the PFI with no bridge. I hold a U.S. patent on the PFI and have a financial interest in the project. After my presentation last month, I emailed copies to each of you and Secretary Gwen. I received no follow-up questions and no comments. I understand FDOT will be giving the presentation today. As I explained last month, they are misrepresenting both SPUI and PFI alternatives. They're grossly underreporting the full extent of congestion at the SPUI signal on 41 and 54 ramps. Their evaluation matrix indicates by 2045 delay at the SPUI will be around three minutes, a.m. and p.m. This is very wrong. FDOT's traffic analysis results show 10 of 12 movements at the SPUI buoy signal in the AM will be congested, i.e. oversaturated, and all 12 movements in the PM. For oversaturated conditions, FDOT should report max vehicle delays and max queues by approach. My spooey analysis indicates for the AM peak, 41 southbound having over 20 minute delays and almost three mile queues, and PM both directions <coughs> over 20 minutes and two miles. For the AM peak, the 54 ramps both directions, 10 minute delays and half mile queues. Even opening year, it looks like the spooey signal will queue back through the Dale Mabry intersection during the PM peak period. If you don't believe me, ask them to redo their VSIM results following the FDOT traffic analysis handbook, correcting for unmet demand. Their results should agree with mine. This is the right way to do it and what should have been done in the first place. Regarding their PFI, they designed it to fail. They refused to follow my signal specs and refused to add auxiliary three lanes as needed. The reasons were spurious and guaranteed the PFI would have failing movements, which in turn causes the PFI to have excessive impacts on local access. I urge you to compare their presentation to mine from last meeting. I realize it gets technical, but I'll answer any questions you have under oath if you want. FDOT is presenting the SPUI as their preferred alternative, yet a proper PFI is objectively far superior in every way. But to understand why and how it requires the SPUI signal to be analyzed and reported correctly and the PFI designed and reported correctly. And if so, the SPUI fails spectacularly. 
and the PFI should be congestion free through 2045 with better overall local access than the SPUI. FDOT is also proposing to add a new alternative taking 41 over 54. Doing so will have even more impacts and greater cost. And putting the signal on 54 will be even more congested than on 41. Just more unnecessary distraction and delay. Questions? Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Parsons? No, seeing that. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Thank you. All right, do we have anybody else that wants to address the board? Seeing none, I'll move to the next agenda item, which is the approval of the minutes, correct? Yes. Mr. Chair, move approval. Second. I have well, a motion. Pardon me. Yes. Um, we don't have minutes for this meeting, so that we'll have to ask to be considered at our next meeting, please. Okay. So have a withdrawal of the I measure. retract my, oops. <laughs> oops. <laughs> yeah. I've, yes, good, very good. Sorry about that. Um, I don't like these around. All right, now we have our advisory committee reports. Sandy Graves. Um, a report, of course, was given about your meeting in January. Uh, we held elections for officers in two, uh, 2023, and um, Sandy Graves, I, uh, was re-elected to serve as chair for my second and final year, and James Mallow was elected as vice chair. We tabled the bylaw amendments due to technical problems. We reviewed and approved uh, unanimously the 2023 system for performance report and performance measures targeting recommended by the MPO staff and required by certain transportation acts of the federal government. The target will now be based on a 10% reduction of the current five-year uh, five rolling average. There was also a great deal of discussion on the importance of setting goals that save uh, many lives in Pasco County. We, we think that was very important and had a long discussion on it. The CAC uh, reviewed and discussed our membership roster and attendance record. We approved the recommendation of staff for reapproval of this board for Mr. Clint Wynn, Mr. Steve Hickman, Mr. David West, and myself. Uh, I'm glad they did that. Uh, several possible people were recommended to join the CAC. I think you're going to discuss those today. And uh, we continue to ask your assistance in helping to build our committee. It was suggested by a member of the MPO board that we discuss a conceptual ridge road extension from US 41 to I-75 at Overpass Road. Um, there was concern expressed by some members of the CAC on the environmental impact to the Cypress Wellfield and water rights. Um, there was a motion to oppose, but no second, as CAC members felt it was premature to discuss because the project is not currently in the MPO Long Range Transportation Plan or documents. MPO staff recommended the discussion regarding Ridge Road Extension be brought before the MPO board as part of the CAC meeting report to the board. The CAC members expressed support for an open dialogue between all committees and the MPO board as, uh, as a conceptual Ridge Road extension is discussed. Go Pasco, Mr. Toole apprised us that Go Pasco ended the fiscal year up 5% for um, paratransit trips and up 3% on fixed route trips from the previous year. Trips are up 9.5% for the current quarter from the same quarter last year. Uh, projecting increase in 2023 to increase by 7.6% and we found that very exciting. Um, he thought, of course, he's affected by uh, the driver shortage in hiring. We were given an update on the Morris Bridge Road, State Road 56 intersection. We were also given information on a new traffic operations request form online for Pasco residents to request traffic devices, including signals, guardrails, signage, sidewalks, and other traffic infrastructure, which we felt was um, important and, and great to hear. And our next meeting will be held Wednesday, March 1st. Thank you. All right. Does anyone have any questions? We sure appreciate you coming and presenting today, and thank you for your service on the board. So, thank you. Thank you. And I thank Carl last year for doing it for me. <laughs> thank you.
Thank you. All right, the TAC, do we have a report? Or BPAC, just gonna go to the BPAC, okay. No. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, I'm used to following yeah, TAC. So, uh, Randy Stovall, chairman of BPAC, we met um, and uh, didn't have any public comment that day, but we had a lot of good discussion. Um, we, we thank you for approving our bylaws change at your last meeting, so that's good. Um, John, thank you John and Tina, uh, both talked about the safety targets for 2023 and as CAC that took a lot of discussion for us at BPAC. In fact, uh, I think that was probably the biggest part of our day to talk about that. Um, and something that is important to the, the bicycle pedestrian group is consideration for more routinely, I would say, installing overpasses where there are really busy roads. And I know we have two coming up that we're going to do. Um, but the discussion was, it's very expensive. We know it's very expensive, but it's also safe. And it will save lives in the long run. So to the extent we can afford to, to look into that, we thought that would be a good recommendation. Uh, the other thing we talked about was in, in very busy areas, it would be helpful to have physical barriers separating bike lanes from the traffic. Uh, and it, again, that can be expensive, not nearly as much as overpasses, of course. Um, <clears throat> and then, and then the, the discussion turned is, you know, we have, we have good reports and good data. We have good goals, 10% reduction in, in um, safety or, or in, in fatalities and serious accidents. That's a great goal, but what do you do? How do, you, how do you make that happen? And so we talked about the value of the uh, PASCO Community Traffic Safety Team called CTST. It is a FDOT facilitated group. Uh, our Tina Russo chairs the group, but it includes members from FDOT, from traffic operations, uh, law enforcement, and they meet every month and they have a map. The map says, here's all the serious accidents in Pasco County. And they very, they very seriously talk about how they can uh, prevent future accidents. So it's a great group. They are making uh, improvements. I reported on that last month. I know I wasn't here, but it was in my report. So CTST is a great thing and we're lucky to have it. So we got a report that you're gonna hear today as well on the SR um, uh, 54 and 41 intersection. And um, good luck, that's a hard, that's a hard one. So. Um, then we had, a, we had a status report from Tina on the various uh, bike pad projects in the county. And again, we're very pleased that we're getting overpasses uh, for the Sun Coast Trail at SR 54 and SR 52. However, SR 54 and the Sun Coast is a very, again, a very, very busy road. 54 has a lot of traffic there. And so the group is wanting to see if we can have physical barriers between the bike riders and the traffic as you go under the underpass. Um, we also talked about the Orange Belt Trail, and we know we had the good meetings in, in the east part of the county. We know we have good progress taking place over here. Um, we look forward to continuing to find the best path for East Pasco. Our next meeting is March 1. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for that report. But I, I did want to say, because I, I attend most of the BPAC meetings. She I did. don't attend them when they're in Dade City. Uh -huh. um, but Land Lakes and the others, I think. And, one of the um, things we did discuss, and I'm glad the secretary is here, um, is that maybe we should be looking at more underpasses. Because mm -hmm. it seems like mm -hmm. they're cheaper than an overpass. Mm -hmm. And if every so often we could have state roads just get elevated a little bit and put an underpass, I think mm -hmm. that everyone has to use, you know? Because sometimes with a bike overpass, some people won't use it because they don't right. want to go up and then down. But um, certainly underpasses, um, I think, are cheaper mm -hmm. and um, maybe safer. So just wanted Thank to you for bringing that up. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. All right. Do we have a TAC uh, report or no? No? Okay. Let's move on to the action items. And the first action item is... Uh, is the MPA officer elections for the 2023 year. Carl. And 
with your permission, I'll take over this part of the sure. agenda. Uh, today we'll be electing both a chair and a vice chair uh, of the MPO board. Elections do require a nomination, and so I'll ask for a nomination for chair first, and we will do vice chair separately, please. Nominate Matt Murphy for chair. Second. Part. Okay. Thank Maybe you. Second. Are there any other nominations? Seth. All right. We commit just for the newbie. We usually we leave that to the cities because you get paid a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> and this gives them a wonderful. You know, we just leave it to us. All right. I'll close <laughs> nominations. Mm -hmm. Uh, seeing as we have one nominee, I don't believe we'll need a vote. If you'd like, we can make this unanimous. All in favor? Aye. 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 There we go. Thank you. Here you go, boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, the former chair has a script he can pass over to you. Okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll get a farewell meeting? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> See you later, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't have to move? No, we're good. No. Nah. Okay. I'm sure we're fine. Um, now I'd like to open it up to vice chair of the MPO board. Do we have a nomination, please? I would like to nominate Gary Bradford, which is different from what we've known for you. No, know, I'll say why. Uh, for years, uh, because I think as we're going to be working with Moffitt, trying to get 41, if I'm going to have an MPO chair from the district where that rail line's going to run, I think it'll carry some weight, and I think we need to get a focus to that. Well, I'm not going to second that. It does require a second, please. I, I like the way we've had it. I, I don't think you have to be chair of the MPO to have any. I, I think he, we can be effective. Um, I just don't want to stop the tradition. Hmm. OK, no one else wants to. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jack, make another motion. I'm not making another motion. OK, um, I mean, uh, okay which one of you two wants it? Scott's, Scott's the one now. Right, well, I would, sure. Scott's, I'll, I'll nominate Scott for vice chair. He's I'll, left. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> Only one standing. <laughs> okay, are there any other nominations? All right, hearing none, all in favor of Mr. Bl uh, Council Commissioner Scott Black as vice chair? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Congratulations, sir. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations to each of you for chair and vice chair. Uh, I'd like to hand it back to you for, or I'm sorry, to Councilman Murphy for the rest of the agenda. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll go move on to action item two, which is the 2023 system performance report and safety targets, Tina Russo and Johnny Kors. Got it here. So thank you, everyone. Tina Russo, Active Transportation Planner for Pasco MPO, um, Shawnee Court. So each year we're required to do our performance um, safety measures. So this is the, the background on the report. So I'm just going to get to the presentation really quick. So each year we're required to do this, and we're just as Johnny and I spent a lot of time and effort in, in doing this as well because it's more than just, <coughs> just numbers. So we, you've heard the presentation. We've given this presentation to all of our committees. We also made this presentation to current planning because it's really important that we kind of spread the word about our fatalities and our serious injuries. So the main thing we want to focus on when we call them accidents, that means they're preventable. When we call them crashes, that means they are able to be prevented. So we want to change the language. We don't want to call these accidents anymore. We want to call them crashes because we want to try to prevent them and change that behavior. So one of the first things we want to talk about is not calling them accidents, but call, calling them crashes. And Johnny, jump in anytime. So we want to realize that this data, this crash data is not just a number on a piece of paper, especially to us. It is a story. These are stories of people's lives that are affected forever by these numbers also. So these pictures, these photos in this presentation all come from Pasco County, all come from within the last year or so. So those are pictures to remind us it's not just about a number on a piece of paper, and that's what we're going to talk about. 
So we're required to do this by Federal Highway, we're required to do this, and we're required to use the numbers that FDOT gives us. We also have access to something called Signal 4 and crash management data that we look at basically daily to kind of figure out how the best way to prevent these crashes. But these numbers are required by FDOT. They do not include last year's 22 numbers, but we're gonna show you those because it's important for us to know what those numbers are because we had a goal last year that we didn't meet. So we're required to do that, we use these numbers. We're also based our numbers on five-year averages. And the reason why we do that is, you're gonna see how our numbers go up and down from year to year for different reasons. But that five-year average gives us a trend which is more important. So we're gonna talk about that. We have to talk about our number of fatalities that's required of us. We also have to talk about that number of fatalities based on our vehicle miles. We know that the growth of Pasco County is increasing greatly. So those vehicle miles gives us an idea of what that's about because that's more miles traveled on our roads. We talk about serious injuries as well. We also talk about serious injuries based on those vehicle miles. We also talk, and unfortunately they lump all our non-motorized cyclists and best pedestrians and serious injuries into one number even though we separate them out and look at them greatly, as you know with 19 specifically. So our fatalities. So last year, or 21, which is what we have to base our data on, in 21 we had that 105. You can see why we're gonna do this five-year trend. You can see how this thing dipped and came back up, okay? Different things happen that cause our fatalities to go up and down in all of our vulnerable users and vehicle crashes as well. So that's why we use that five-year trend more than just our annual fatalities. <coughs> this is our vehicle miles. This always comes up in our conversations about, well, Pasco's growing, you got more people coming in, which is true. But we have, we have that dip in 20 because of COVID. You can see that top line up there, that's our vehicle miles travel. We had that little dip in 20. What we didn't have compared to Hillsborough Canales have a greater dip in vehicle miles travel in 20 compared Chair, to past. Can I just um, ask, yes. Tina, Tina, how do they calculate the vehicle miles travel? And do you think it's accurate? I mean. I'm going to let Johnny talk about it because we've had this conversation about vehicle miles quite lengthy. And again, it comes from DOT. Okay. And we, we may be able to let DOT even give a more detailed answer than I can. Um, but <laughs> even looking at the data that we get yearly, we do see pretty significant revisions to the VMT. So I think that is probably an issue with how do you calculate VMT. Uh, the exact methodology, I don't know if anybody from DOT can can help us with that, but we do see revisions on a yearly basis and some of them are pretty significant, especially this year going back to 2020, um, especially with the reduction due to COVID. Um, I don't think there was, they had a good handle on, on how to update that at the time, so we, that was revised. And what we can do since now, it seems to become very pertinent, we'll look into that and get more information on it on Viva Miles. We've also had discussion in our committees about per capita as part of, of that equation as well, um, but, also. Yes, and if I could, because I, I just think it would be a really difficult thing to, to calculate. And, and I guess if, if you use the same methodology year after year, you should be okay. But if, it, if something like COVID came in, maybe it does impacted. I don't, I don't even know how you start to calculate that, you know? Well, I think that's why DOT uses that five-year trend because you have so many discretions, you know, between vehicle miles and COVID and different things that that's where that five-year trend kind of helps with that, those different things that are right. kind of, I call them gray areas, so to speak. Um, so that's why we want to show that. I think the big conversation that we've had with vehicle miles is because of COVID, we did have that drop and that we didn't have as significant a drop as our neighboring counties did. And that kind of shows based on this. And like Johnny said, those numbers keep moving a little bit as well. So this is the, the important number that we're required, and that's our five-year average total of fatalities. 
So our average from that 2002, um, 2010, 14, which was around 67, 68, you can just see this unfortunate trend of our mortalities just keep going up. So we went from 16 or 20 there to 21 from that 100 to 104. So we use that five year trend more than anything else because it shows the trend that's happening with our fatalities. And again, we use that five year trend for our serious injuries as well. But you can see the bad part is we're going in the wrong direction. We are going up in fatalities. Commissioner? Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair? Yeah. Thank you. In your formula, are these fatality numbers captured off every road that rolls through Pasco County or interstates excluded, state roads excluded? Do you just count in county roads? What's for the rookie, what's the? So these numbers are calculated based on long form crash reports that are done on all of our roadways done by law enforcement. And everything, our, all the behaviors that we talk about that we're gonna show how these things happen are based on those crash reports. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But yeah, those are all our roadways. DOT roadways, local roads, um, all roadways that comes from a crash report that's done by law enforcement, by a long form crash report. So um, with 19, we found out not everything gets reported either. So we do miss some data, but this is the only data that we can use um, for that information. And pedestrians are included with this vehicle? Yeah, you're gonna pedestrian. see that. Okay, okay. Right. So, and we can come back. What, this is kind of really just a snapshot of fatalities and the issues going on with crashes. This is very much a small snapshot. We delve into it, as you guys know, we really delve into the behavior and where crashes happen and how they happen and those things. We're gonna to touch on it just a little bit, but this is just a snapshot of what you're talking about based on that. We do use a program called Signal 4 and Crash Management Dynamic where we actually look at every one of those crash reports and delve into how can we prevent these or what can we do different to change Mr. Starkey, do you have something? Yeah, um, well, can you finish, sir? I'm done, thank you. Uh, so we went over this in the BPAC and had a lot of questions. Um, and one of the questions I asked was, if we were able to get these numbers based on population as well, like is it an increase per capita <coughs> or decrease? That's a good question. And did, were, are we able to get, were we able to get this number? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. It's not a requirement for one of the um, federal performance measures, but the staff can, if we can get an idea of what our population is right now, which is you know difficult because of the rate of growth in Pasco County, but we can get an estimate of population and yes, do a, a per capita crash rate analysis, but that is not one of the required <laughs> federal performance measures. But you see why the interesting to plug it in. Are we getting worse per capita? Are we getting better per capita? I think it's it's a good number to know personally. We'll get some look back into that and go from there. I think we talked about that as well. Um, our mean streets report used to be based on per capita, so we can go back and look at some other um, data that used to use um, per capita and kind of go from there. And again, we, you know, that's a moving target as well. But we'll look at that and kind of see what we can find per capita as well. So this is our rolling average, that five um, year rolling average with our fatalities. That, that photo there uh, on that slide is just the right, happened the end of last year where there was two seriously injured, one of those young seven year old did die from that crash um, also. So, um, so these are more than just numbers on a piece of paper. So we, we talk about our serious injuries as well. Um, and again, we talk about that based on a five year rolling average. So, and this is true for our neighboring counties and it's true basically at a national average as well. Our serious injuries are going down. Good news. We base that, we think some of the thought process is, is our vehicles are, have a lot more safety equipment on them and safety different things. So, and when we look at crash reports, we can actually see some of those vehicles that are in that fatality rate are those older cars that don't have some of those safety equipment. Um, Seatbelt use is down, so, um, so go figure it on that. But our serious injury based on that five year trend is going down and that's true for our neighboring counties and the national average as well. So 
our bicycle pedestrian fatalities, something near and dear to my heart. Again, we lump everything together for this report, even though we don't lump them together as we look at them. That little table at the bottom basically kind of shows you the big difference between our pedestrian fatalities and our bicycle fatalities and even the injury. Of course, our pedestrian fatalities are much higher than our bicycle, and we know where those areas are, but I just wanted to just show, show you that difference between the two. The behavior is very similar with the cause of the crashes and the fatalities and serious injuries. But again, there's a little bit of a dip, but one's too many as far as we go. Unfortunately, that ghost bike there is one in Pasco County that just happened at the end of last year as well. Mr. Chair? Thank you, Mr. Tina, I'm glad you broke at least these two out, which is good. And I think last year we talked about how many times do we check the pedestrians or the bicyclists to see if they were drug impaired. So that goes back to that crash report. Um, not all the time they're not tested um, is the problem with that. And I think we brought that out some bit, a little bit with our 19 um, presentation we did. Not all of them are tested for several different reasons and not all that information is always on that crash report. So unfortunately it's a, in certain areas it's a high number percentage that are impaired but we don't know, we don't have a real accurate number on that impairment when it comes to pedestrians and cyclists. What can we, what can we do to make a, a mission to find out that data? Because I will tell you around 19, there's a lot of homeless camps that are out there. You get a lot of people drug induced. We put a right of way safety ordinance in place to try to keep that from happening. We try to enforce it to keep them out of those interchanges. So, you know, I think even details whether someone's crossing or someone's walking or what, and, all those details, I think, will matter. And I don't think we're going to get them all in every report that's done. And, and we're starting to do that a little bit with, with our partners. And again, that's where the community, um, Pasco Community Traffic Safety Team kind of comes in. We look at problem sites and hazardous areas. But we're also working with Bayonet Point Hospital and some other folks <coughs> that have a little bit of a connection with what's going on as well, other than our law enforcement partners as well. That, it's a, that one's, when you talk about behavior, and we're going to talk about some of the behavior that we can look at working with, that is something that we're looking at and is a big part of that. And one other thought. Um, you have vehicles here, but you don't break out with the motorcycles or not? I can, I can break out whatever you want. This is just based well, on it, that snapshot of well, that Well, if we're report. going to look at fatalities, and yeah. guess what? If, if a car's going to hit a motorcycle, chances are it's going to end yeah. up in a I, fatality, right? So I think that's important data to look at, too. And we can bring those details to you in the next board meeting. Again, this is just what's required because of this report. I'm more than glad to bring you more details about our crash data because that's what we do and that's what we look at to make a difference. Thank you. We know motorcycles are vulnerable users, one of our top ones. We know that, unfortunately. Commissioner Weaver. Thank you. You had a piggyback on, I almost said Chair Mariano, Commissioner Mariano's point, to know the data of if someone was impaired by some sort of substance, especially up and down 19, that, that's important information because then that can help us target to help these folks to avoid these accidents from happening. So, so um, supportive of Commissioner Mariano and, and in his line of thinking to see what we can do to capture that data and then maybe we can take some sort of action plan to prevent these accidents. We'll take a look at um, impaired and some different things. And, um, again, we just started doing that. And DOT has been actually still doing engagement along 19, where we physically, they physically go out and talk to people. And that's a good way to get a good idea of what's going on as well. So we will go, we'll do a deeper dive in some of these details that you were asking about and bring them to you. We'd like to add one thing. Yep. We have looked through the crash reports and I believe in Florida it is not a requirement that a toxicology report be conducted unless there's probable cause. So that's been one of our big issues is some of the crashes there has been a toxicology report done and some of them there just has not been a report done. Even if, even if it involves a fatality or a serious injury. So that's one of the issues that we did look at and that was one of the, one of the problems that we had is there's no data there to really report. On, on that. Mr. Chair? I mean, I think it's something worthwhile looking at, especially if it is a fatality, that would be important to know. So I don't know how you get probable cause when someone's dead, but um, 
to me, it would be, it, it, it's got to be important data. Um, so you would like to see if that any of those fatalities, pedestrian, were impaired or not? You want to see a percentage? Is that what you're asking? Correct. I mean, okay. You, you've got it down here on the chart in the upcoming slides where it says you've got whether someone's drowsy or ill driving. I don't know what that really means. Right. And you're going to see some, yeah. Um, right. And we can do a little bit deeper dive into that re those reports and see specifically based on fatalities. I think one other thing to maybe break down as well to take a look at, which I think you can do easily, easy enough. Let, let's go take a look at uh, the, uh, most of these actions on arterials, collectors, residential roads. I think most of the answer is going to be arterial, but it'd be good to know. Because like that one on Westy Chapel Boulevard, if the two-lane road cross, it hits um, on an intersection where you break those out too. If they're multi-lane intersection or not, might be, might be, might, might be good data to look at. We're going to take a little peek at that a little bit again because that wasn't required in this report but we're going to take a peek in that because we think it's important and the reason why we picked the number we did as well so this is our fatality targets that we've had over the years I've done this this is my basically my second year um, great conversation Johnny and I kind of kind of say that we draw the short straw in doing this because it's always a tough conversation but as we adopted this number, that number has kept going up. Now, if we truly want to lessen our fatalities and have a vision of lesser fatalities, a goal towards zero, that number doesn't need to keep going up, okay? What we've adopted the last couple of years, that number's gone up. I think there was a zero a few years ago before, before our time, I don't know that, but we, in the last couple of years, have it adopt, adopted a number. Last year, the number we picked was based on holding to a five-year trend. That's not going in the right direction. So this is that table that we're going up. We feel and think, feels part of it, unfortunately, but we think that we're going the wrong way with these numbers on adopting our performance safety measure. Okay. We're just the planners in here. It takes a lot of group of people to make these numbers change. Cities that adopted Vision Zero, if they reached them, it took them 10, 20 years, if they were able to reach them. So what we wanted to do is try to go in a different direction. We want to try, in that first couple of slides, it talks about our money's not depending on whatever number we have. Federal Highway doesn't want us to pick a number that's unrealistic either. So we're picking a number that we and I shouldn't say pick, there's a methodology to this, the number we're picking is a 10% reduction in that five-year rolling average. So last year, we picked 99.8, 100 folks was our average, and that was hoping that we would maintain that five-year rolling average. We have a goal of 93.8, 94, whatever you want to say, and of course that 10% goes across the board for all of those areas that we have to adopt. So we didn't make that last year. I'm not supposed to show you 22, but I'm gonna show you 22. This was 101. This slide was printed or copied two weeks ago. This was for year 22. That number has already changed to 104 for last year. It takes 30 days. You know, reports get done, especially if they're fatality. It takes, you know, that's a moving target, unfortunately, to get that information, those long reports. The investigation of a fatality can take months sometimes. So that's, that number changes. That's why they only base it onto 21. But we know last year in Pasco County, we had 104 fatalities. Our goal was 94. That map, I know it's small and we can delve into this deeper. That map shows you our hot spots, our heat areas. We've talked about this before. Our fatalities are all over. There is no silver bullet in Pasco County. There is no exact intersection that we can really focus on where most of our numbers are. We know 19 is a big part of it, all right? We've done some work already on certain areas already that we're hopefully gonna be able to work on greater. So on that left column there, it says emphasis areas. We know the behavior that is happening that is causing people to be killed. 
Now there's usually a combination. I'll give you an example. Lane departures is one of our biggest ones, okay? Most of those are people driving off the road and hitting a fixed object with no seatbelt on, okay? So the occupancy, safety, and the lane departure go hand in hand with that one. Our aging drivers are a big one. Intersections, again, there's a lot of behavior that happens in those top four or five that are on that list of emphasis. But those are the areas we know that we can start looking at and working with our partners because again, we're just a planning organization. We're at the mercy of traffic ops, project management, land development, current plan, and that's why we're going out to as many people and excuse the expression, preaching this that has to happen for us to, to go in a different direction. So that's, we'll delve into that deeper for you guys at a later date. Because um, we could definitely speak at this a very long time. Mr. Chairman? Commissioner? So when I look at the map, and Catherine, you've got to clean up that district. Uh, I, well, <laughs> I, I, I tried to switch, but no one would switch. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, so when I look at that, that section from county line to holiday coming up, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how far that goes up, that's a, like a, 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 a lot. Mm -hmm. Now that's US 19, right? Correct. That's 19 now, now look, look from over, over where the first like two dots are from the side of that, all the way across 54, mm -hmm. all the way to 41. There's nothing. So why is it so good there compared to the 19? We can bring you those points, and we, I think last year we did, but we can bring you some points. Yeah. And again, those are heat maps. They show you the, the areas and right. stuff. But we do and. That's changing constantly is 54 and Little. If you notice the parallel quarter to 19, mm -hmm. Little's becoming kind of a hot spot, unfortunately, as well. So um, again, it's the behavior as well as the corridor that we need to kind of emphasize on. Mr. Mr. Boynton, thank you. The dot, I'm gonna assume that's up in Bellamy Brothers Ayers Road area. Uh, you talking about one right there in the middle there? In the yeah. north, kind of central. With the amount of traffic that's coming out of Hernando these days, Bellamy is, it's pretty, you know, it's like a highway. So is there, I guess because of all the folks coming south, is there any kind of coordination with folks in Hernando in so, traffic calming or something in that area? So, perfect timing. Thank you oh, for leading me into right. something, a conversation. So one of the areas that we've been working on is Bellamy. We've had three or four fatalities in that north piece. Traffic Ops has done some great um, countermeasures, we call them, in some of those areas where we've had fatalities. They've gone a little bit north. Um, DOT is going to actually help us with a road safety off of it from 52 all the way up to county line and that will give us some low, medium, high countermeasures that we can look at and kind of go from there. Um, and again, we know it's a hot spot um, as well and we know there's going to be some development going on closer to the 52, but we're getting ready to do a road safety audit with DOT to kind of, kind of figure some of those things out. I'd also like to add that every Friday morning at 7.45 a.m., the executive director of the Hernando Citrus MPO and myself have a standing phone call. And it is only missed if one of us is on vacation. We're also looking, of course, south, as you saw, too, and even Pinellas, which is where 19 and alternate 19, that other hot spot in that bottom left-hand corner as well. So again, how do we change these fatalities and even do better with our serious injuries. And that is through what DOT's adopted, Federal Highways adopted, and that's a safe system approach. We've always talked about the five E's. You gotta have, we call them the five-legged stool. You gotta have all those things working together to make a difference. That's engineering, that's education, that's enforcement. We've used engagement now, environment, which is our land development codes, all those things have to work together for us to lower that number. So zero is our goal. This is how we go about it, is a safe system approach, working with lots of folks to make that happen. These are just some bullet points on how those things work. Speed's a big one, I'm gonna go ahead to that. Speed is always a big one, and this is the pedestrian one, but if you're an aging driver, speed's a big difference. You're not gonna be able to survive a certain speed vehicle crash 
as you get older, even with the type of safety equipment we have in our vehicles. So these are all important. Speed management, and at the end of the day, how we design our roadways, the width of our roadways, if it's wide, people are gonna drive faster. So there's lots of different things that go into slowing people down um, as well. And then that education, and of course, having clear goals about how we do this, and this is where we're starting to do this, having clear goals about how we do this, but then having our officials kind of stick with that. Congestion sometimes is the best thing for safety. Oh. Yep. So, so <laughs> people don't like it, but the reason why you drive fast is because you can. Mm -hmm. So speed, again, becomes a big part of this. So if you could stop for a second on that thought. Sure. Um, so on Bellamy Brothers Road, that's how I come up actually when I come to Dade City yeah. from 52 coming up. And that road, if you veer out because of the narrowness of the road, it's more dangerous because there's ditches. Right. So when you say it's safer having narrow roads, I'm going to disagree with you there. No, that's not, I didn't say just narrow roads. No, so, but I'm I mean, saying, again, so be... 11 foot lane with safety edges is totally different than an 11 foot lane with no shoulder at all. So, and that's, we can talk about that a little bit later. And one of the things that we're looking at Bellamy is providing that safety edge. And again, that's what that road safety audit will do for us is what is our low, medium, high countermeasures that we can do to make that road safer for all users. I, I was driving down 5A the other day and I had a car like just swerving right into my lane. It was like, whoa. Thank goodness there was room to get off the road and they made the turn to get back on the road so nothing happened. But if that was a ditch on Bellamy, I'm gone. That, that I'm taking the risk of a head on collision if she doesn't make the turn or not. Mr. Starkey. Um, so when we built Aristida, we purposely made the road a little narrower and put the mailboxes closer to the street and curved the road a little bit so that people would slow down. Uh, like I said, it's uncomfortable to go fast on that road um, and that uncomfortableness makes you go slower. But I do believe the county just made a mistake on Lake Blanche Drive. Um, it is a straight shot with no crossroads on it. Um, and so, and that's Lake Blanche Drive is, goes from Starkey Boulevard into Starkey Ranch Development to the new park. And we have drag racing going on. Um, and kids zipping up and down it uh, in uh, little motorcycles, young kids. Um, uh, but the thing is it's a golf cart community so that right now that road has a 25 mile an hour speed limit and I do believe we're going to raise it to 35, but we should have put a traffic circle in there somewhere to slow, mm -hmm. slow them down. Um, I don't know what you can do on a traffic cal for traffic calming on that road, but, I, but we have to be careful when we build roads that we're not building sp speedways. So. No, I think they did a great, sorry, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I mean, I think they did a great job with that. That whole, that whole design in there, I mean, if, if you want to avoid the 54 and you want to go, you know, make a trek from Starkey. Oh, I through. go through that road all the time. It's just that. And I think it's super safe. And if you're on a golf fast. cart, you've got the roadways. I mean, the trail's off to the side. If I had yeah. a golf cart, that's where I'd be anyway. But the cars are going, it, it, the design, well, you you all know this. People will drive the speed they feel safe on. And they you can feel very safe going 75 miles an hour down that road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so because there's nothing. So we should have put something in there. I think they have a three-way stop coming in and that will stop it a little bit, but we're getting complaints from the residents of Esplanade about drag racing going on on that road at night. So, so I think that's the, the part of this and we're gonna go back to the, the action item is that we all have a role in this to change that number. Um, we all get in our cars and drive the speed limit or faster, right? you know, so we all get in our vehicles <coughs> as well. So we're part of the, the problem or help not be part of the problem. But we all have a role in this. Again, we're more of a planning organization. We look at the numbers. We can only suggest to project management to traffic off some things that you know we see. And actually, that's what the MPO is for, is to be able to be, I call it the bad cop sometimes, be the one to say, hey, we need this on Bellamy Brothers. Hey, we need this at 52 and Hicks. We changed the, the signalization at 52 and Hicks, and it seems to be helping. So um, it's all of us being a part of this 
to make a difference in lowering our fatalities. And again, one is one too many. I, I did have one question on Bellamy Brothers. I, when I looked it up, and I don't take it very often, but it has that funky, um, it's called Bent Fork Road area, mm -hmm. and then St. Joe. Are we gonna improve that? Are we gonna straighten that out, put a traffic circle? I mean, that looks like, that looks like trouble. So that's why DOT hires somebody separate to come in and do a road safety audit to do those low countermeasures, which are a little bit less, quicker to do, medium and high. So those high might be something like a roundabout and changing the alignment of the road. So that's why they come in and look at the big picture from least you know, cost to higher cost. So, um, and that's what they do. They'll go in and provide that information well, to us. I, I am sure one day that will be changed. So, and we're um, we're looking at road safety on on um, audits on a lot of our resurfacing projects, so we can take advantage of anything that can be done to that road. So again, this is an action item. Um, we're asking for a 10% reduction on those five areas um, as we adopt and. We're going to need everybody's help to go towards that as well. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Russo. Um, this item will require approval. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And we'll come back with some of those requests from you guys at a, a later um, board meeting. Thank you. I will add also that DOT has offered to bring a, a more detailed presentation to you guys about um, VMT calculations, so, so that will be coming also. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, and we have the 2022-23 uh, Citizens Advisory Committee membership roster and attendance record. Mr. Kors. And can, can I make a statement about this? Because when you look at my name, it says vacant, 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 vacant. But James Mallow <laughs> was my appointee. <laughs> And he recently switched to Mariano's appointee. So sorry about that. And so all those yeah. presents were under me. But I do have to find you. And I will do a better job in, of informing you guys also <laughs> if we have a, a resignation from the committee also. Uh, I have two separate um, membership items to bring to you. Uh, the first is I am requesting reapproval of uh, four CAC members. Uh, Clint Wynn, who is the primary representative from District 4. Uh, primary representative from Dade City, Steve Hickman. Uh, alternate representative for Dade City, David West. And also Sandy Graves, who is an at-large member. I would like to be able to lump a lot of these reapprovals together. Um, that's part of why I'm um, asking you for all four of these today, so I don't have to bring you individual representatives for reapproval at every meeting and we can do them in more of a, of a group. Mr. Chair, move approval. This is excluding the District 2 applicants, right? Yes. Excluding the District 2 applicants. Right. Okay. Those applicants haven't, haven't been approved yet. Second. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, the second item I would like to, to bring up is the staff has received two CAC membership applications from District 2. And uh, would Commissioner Waitman, would you like to take any action on those applications? No, sir. I asked to continue this item. Um, I've not met with either one of these applicants and uh, haven't shopped it. So I ask that we continue the District 2 uh, representation to say April, the April meeting. Okay. Give me time to round up some folks. Okay. Thank and, you. And I would say I, I have been trying to find some as well, but my first two have uh, let me down, so I don't, I don't have anyone in the hopper yet, but I will try by that time as well. Okay. Thank you all for your prompt action on, uh, on looking for Representatives, are there any other questions? Anyone? All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think next up we have the, the Go Pass Go update. Good morning, I'm James Flaherty, Assistant Director for Go Pasco. 
So the CAC already gave you the numbers uh, from last year during their report. So this year we're actually projecting to be increasing our ridership again. Our fixed route, we're looking to be potentially 612,000, which is a pretty good number. Um, again, we're not even halfway through the fiscal year, so it's just a, a soft projection, but we'll, we'll keep refining as we go through and keep you up to date. Our paratransit looks like we're gonna go from about 44,000 to 48,000, which is a pretty decent jump. Again, not quite halfway through the year, so a soft projection. Uh, for fixed route, we are having six new Gillig buses go into production in April. We will be receiving them in May. Uh, so that's good, that should help reduce our cost for maintenance because we're moving out older vehicles, bringing in newer vehicles. We're partnering with Cutter as we develop our scope for a new network study. Uh, it's gonna help revamp our system, show us where we're a bit deficient, where we can uh, get a little bit better. Uh, we're also partnering with them for an ITS procurement scope, so that way we can bring real-time uh, information to our riders to get more reliable and more predictable. Uh, the last thing is we also have a project to do some ADA enhancements along our corridors, and we have specific projects along like, uh, for example, behind 5A High School, uh, we're putting in a pad back there. We're doing a retaining wall over on 52 at Bear Creek. Uh, we're looking to become more ADA compliant at 52 and 19, where we have a shelter over there. Um, and then another location is up at, or little and 19 meet, but on the west side at that industrial park. We meet Hernando's the bus there, and so we're looking to put a pad in the shelter. So those are some of the big projects that we're working on. And then ADA compliance throughout the corridors, 54, 19, 301. Any questions? Mr. Chair? Sure. Um, so we got six buses coming in? Six new Gillig buses, yes. All right. Are any of them electric? These are not. The, okay. the electric buses, we did have the, the VW grant that we're working through. Uh, we are going to get two new Gillig, potentially Gillig electric buses through that grant. Um, but that won't be for a couple of years. We have to work through the infrastructure in the new fleet building that's going in behind Gail and Wilson to support those buses. There's, there's a lot of funding out there for electric. And I'm, I'm going to the NACO conference coming up with Commissioner Starkey. Mm -hmm. um, and there could be a lot of money out there for electric. And it could also be funding of, of charging stations as well. So I think you guys should look at putting something together for that, put a grant together, and, 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 and apply. Because if that money's out there, someone's going to get it, it might as well be us. Right. So, so that's where the Volkswagen money comes in. So that's kind of like our pilot. That's where we're going to start moving in the direction of electric and the infrastructure. The grants that you're talking about are like the low no grants. And those grants are very competitive. They're nationwide federal grants. You have to show how bringing in this type of service is going to affect local and regional transportation and the population and everything else. They're very in-depth uh, grants. So if we work on one, if we start one now, it would be for next year. I, I, I yes, it's that. definitely something that but we're I think, looking but at. I think it's something we we'll definitely go in. And, and you know, VW's private. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the nation is pushing those things, as you're, as you're saying. So yep. I think you get a lot of things to look at as far as on that US-19. Mm -hmm. You can talk about water quality, air quality, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you can set up a, a the charging station somewhere right along there as well to make it work. And I, I think you get a lot of good things to work on. Absolutely. Those are all good ideas. They're definitely things that we're looking at. And we also have um, attendance uh, at webinars this week. And then there's one, I believe, next month for these grants specifically so we can learn the regulations and requirements. Right. Um, follow up on that. Um, and I'm gonna be talking to Carl. At, I'll be asking you about grants. Hopefully I, I, have, to, I have a board meeting at one something, so I can't stay past 12. But uh, wondering if, you know how we were trying to get into micro transit? Mm -hmm. Would electric mini buses work? A grant to try something new with electric minibuses for micro transit. When you're talking um, minibuses, are you talking well, about smaller. like the cutaway buses, like we use for our paratransit? I don't know what they look like. I'm, I'm sure they're out there though. But um, um, just think, instead of going after the big buses, can we be a little creative and go after little vehicles that are electric that um, work on an app? That isn't that what micro transit is? You have a smaller vehicle that goes and picks someone up and moves them within a zone 
mm -hmm. like to get them to a bus stop or to get them to something in a zone mm -hmm. that I'm just wondering if there's something like that. Maybe Jack, are you going to be doing transportation stuff in DC? Yes. Yeah, that's something to uh, to ask about. I, I like your thought, especially when we just saw the chart. Um, the, one of the biggest categories was el elderly citizens. So maybe we focused it on elderly yeah. to try to cut that down, showed the data. If we had it, that may be a good approach to, to take. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other um, questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so on the microtransit, I, know I thought that you were looking at some certain areas and things to try the microtransit. So that's going to be included in the study that we're working the scope with Cutter for. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Comment on the with the microtransit, if that's a potential, so I'm not sure if this committee, where this would come in, but if we widen the shoulder enough to code and then they come, they have their own lane to travel and then they're out of the general traffic population. Just a thought. that again when you talk when you're when you were talking about micro transit we were talking about bike lanes and that you no know. no with micro transit um it's it's um okay no i don't want to speak your language do you want to explain micro transit better than me it's uh, I mean, you probably know just as much as I do to be honest. Because <laughs> okay. you, you go to a lot of conferences. For Dave Engel can really uh, describe it well. But yeah, so microtransit is you you would select a, a general area. So you're talking geography. Okay. It's a yeah. 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 It, it's like that it's almost like an Uber, but just for a specific area. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's like a government funded Uber within a specific zone. Okay. It's okay. very an cost effective. Area. An huh? underserved area. Yeah. I misinterpreted. Yeah. You're thinking of. Um, uh, Bus rapid Bus transit, yeah, no, BRT I, I, or you, other kinds of mobility, but this is a small vehicle that transports people usually through an app. When you call it, it comes to your house. I used it in San in San Diego at the ULI. They have micro mobility in San Diego. It's a little like a Volkswagen bus thing, little car, and it came and picked me up at my hotel and took me to my next destination for free. And that way, they eliminated parking spaces and cars on the road. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. We, up next, we have a couple of status reports and presentations. Um, first one is US 41 SR 54, Mr. Craig Fox. Hello. Good morning. And thank you for having me here today. Okay, my name is Craig Fox with the Florida Department of Transportation. I'm here to present a 41 and 54. Oh, oh just click it. Okay. Just. Oh, nice. I agree. All right, so I'll just dive right into the presentation. Um, so first, just to recap, a quick, quick recap. Uh, we came up with three alternatives, and the fourth one is always a no-build that we always keep as an alternative. Uh, those three alternatives were based on the results of the Vision 5456 uh, summary report um, back in July of 2018. That included the single point urban interchange, uh, the parallel flow intersection, and also continuous flow intersection uh, with no overpass, and also the no build as always. And I have different um, examples of what those uh, um, alternatives are in the next slide. So alternative number one, this is an example of a single point urban interchange. This is from US 19 and State Road 686, uh, Roosevelt Boulevard in Pinellas County. Uh, you can see it's more of a standard type of intersection with, in this case, US 19 going over 686, and then the turning movements are made at grade underneath the intersection. Uh, the next slide uh, is gonna show a visualization of this type of spooey intersection at the interchange in, interse intersection in question. So this is 41 and 54 visualization. I just want to point out that north is to the right of the screen in this visualization. Uh, so it does have 54 going over US 41. Uh, the next example I'd like to show is uh, the parallel flow intersection. Now this one we just have a visualization for. We don't have an actual um, an example we can pull an image from just because it, as yet there has not one been built in the United States. Uh, but this one does show how that intersection uh, uh, 
would look at 41 and 54. And the third alternative that we're looking at is the continuous flow inter interchange. Uh, we do have one in existence right now is a State Road 82 and a Daniels Parkway. This is in Lee County. And you can kind of see how that functions. Um, and now we do want to note that this does not include an overpass in this example. In our um, visualization, we do have a, an overpass in, at that intersection. So this is a visualization of a continuous flow interchange at 41 and 54. Uh, so you can see 54 goes over 41, and then it has the, the left turn movements are made at grade. Um, and now the CFI and the PFI are kind of similar, but both displaced, what we call displaced left intersections, they kind of um, offset <coughs> where the lefts are actually made. Um, so they're not made directly at that intersection, they're made a little bit before. Uh, so this is the same alternative matrix that we had at the Alternative Public Workshop uh, back in 2019. Um, we covered different items such as the traffic effectiveness, the pedestrian accommodations, property access, and also for potential right-of-way impacts. Um, you can see on there, uh, just based on the raw traffic numbers, uh, one, one item, one reference point uh, that's pretty much easy to differentiate between the three is what we call the network travel time, and this is based on the simulation running multiple, multiple different runs, you know, millions of runs in the simulation, and it, and it spits out um, a single number that we can kind of use. And it's the reason why we have to kind of use that factor is because with the displaced left intersections, they have like kind of five intersections in one, so you can't do a direct one-to-one -one comparison versus like this, this movie alternative one, or the, or the no build as it is today. So we kind of use that figure. So when you're looking at the raw traffic numbers, the best pouring one is alternative three, and then followed by alternative two, and then alternative one as far as traffic is concerned. Um, the alternative matrix, we also did look at the natural, uh, cultural, and physical uh, environment impacts, and also uh, estimates of the present cost. So when you look at the overall cost, uh, this includes the uh, design, right-of-way, construction, uh, wetland mitigation, um, and uh, construction engineering ins inspection phases. Uh, if you look at the total cost at the bottom of the screen on the far right, uh, is 241 for alternative number three, one, 108 for alternative number two, and 222, and these are millions of dollars, by the way, uh, for alternative number one, and of course the bill build is zero dollars because that's just routine maintenance that, that we wouldn't um, include in that cost. Um, now the reason, just want to break out, the reason why alternatives number one and number three are so high is because they have those overpass structures. That's also why alternative one and number three also has a little more right-of-way impacts, is because again, you have that overpass structure which extends the length of the right-of-way impacts and the overall cost of the project. So in addition to just the raw numbers uh, that we look at in the alternative matrix, uh, we also wanted to just zoom out and look at the right context that we're putting, that, that we're looking at the intersection also. So in addition to looking at uh, those numbers on the alternative matrix, we also looked at different items, including pedestrian expectancy. And what we mean by that is how would a pedestrian interact with this intersection, whether they're you know, in a wheelchair, whether they're walking, whether they're they have vision impairment. Uh, one of, just kind of analyze how, how that would be. We also let the driver expectancy, um, how familiar would drivers be with an intersection um, like this. And we also looked at business access because those displaced left interchanges, uh, they also, they, they greatly impact how you would access uh, businesses at all four corners of the intersection. We also looked at residential access and railroad conflicts because uh, with CSX only that rail line, they'll be an important partner we have to partner with and we'll have to have a design that's approved, that's acceptable to them also. So based on those uh, different characteristics, the alternative that the department, oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, so now we're gonna look into some of those uh, items that I mentioned. So first one is the pedestrian expectancy. So you can see in here with single point urban interchange intersection, uh, the, we simulated it from going from the southwest corner to the northeast corner. So if an individual starts there, and the number of points indicate the number of refuge islands that that uh, pedestrian would have to face. So looking at alternative one, they would have about five different refuge islands that have to pause at in navigating that intersection. Um, with the parallel flow intersection, uh, that does increase uh, to around seven different medians. And, we, and when we started to look at pedestrian expectancy, we started to notice that uh, it had some of the kind of same concerns for the parallel flow intersection, were also reflective on uh, the continuous flow intersection that's it's shown on this slide now. 
Uh, you still have those seven different refuge islands you have to stop at, uh, but one thing to note is that when a pedestrian crosses, the direction of traffic changes based on how they, based on where they are and what refuge island they're at, which so is left. You have to remember to look left in one place and right at the other place. Like yes, ma'am. If you're in a foreign country and Americans are always getting smacked because they looked the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> That's a good example, yes, ma'am. Um, so, so, so we did notice that it has a little bit more challenges, especially when you're looking at a more urban environment, such as 41 and 54. Um, now, usually these are these types of displaced lefts are more plus in rural areas, like the example that I showed out of Lee County. You notice the development around there was really sparse and it wasn't wasn't really developed. We also notice that these are typically installed at, um, say, a, an interchange uh, with an interstate, um, where there's you know limited access, so there's less development on the corner. So. Um, so being that it's a more urban environment, you are going to have a more challenging kind of pedestrian experience uh, with those displaced left type of intersections. Um, next, moving on to the driver expectancy. We did still make some runs as far as how you'd access the Pasco Plaza at the northeast corner of the intersection. Uh, so when you look at here with alternative number one with a single point urban interchange, uh, it's fairly conventional to how you'd normally access it today, not too far off. Um, when we look at alternative number two, um, it gets a little more. It gets a little more complex because you, again, you have the displaced left intersections. Uh, it does result in some U-turn, say for instance, for the eastbound direction. Um, say, say. Okay, I'm sorry, but um, please do not interrupt. I didn't interrupt. So we're gonna get to the presentation. All right. Okay, so continue on uh, with the parallel. So continuing on with the parallel flow intersection, uh, like I mentioned, the displaced left intersections do have the same kind of concerns no matter uh, which type of one you're looking at. So maybe when we look at continuous flow intersection, it still has the same kind of concerns with requiring some certain U-turns where there weren't any in the as-built condition. Um, say for instance, when you look at that southbound direction, um, instead of making a southbound and making a left turn on a Carson Drive, now you'd have to kind of uh, go southbound and eastbound and then do a U-turn at the Lowe's driveway. Uh, okay, that's a car. That's horrible. Shame on I was wondering, why do we have two bailiffs today? Now I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, continuing on with residential access. When we look at alternative one, the single point urban interchange, it does result in a difference, and, and this is because you have, now you have the overpass that's crossing the intersection. So that overpass, it does, it, while we can have some turnarounds at certain locations on the, on the overpass, uh, once it starts coming down and goes uh, beneath a certain elevation, you can no longer provide U-turn. So that would force eastbound traffic to make a U-turn just before the intersection of 41 uh, for alternative number one. When you look at alternative number two for the parallel flow intersection, that does uh, force traffic, force users, and this, and I'm sorry, let me make it clear that this, this access to Devon Oak Boulevard on the north side of uh, 54. So that would force uh, users to go through 41 and then make a U turn at the lowest intersection and then make that uh, right turn. <coughs> and it's a similar access for uh, the continuous flow intersection also. You would have to again go through the intersection, make a U turn at the lows, and then make a right on Devon Oak Boulevard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, yes. It, in other words, if they're headed, at, and I don't know if I have this orientation right, they would not be able to turn left off the road into. Yes. How yeah. many? I mean, how many residents are we talking about there? Um, I would. I know that development. It was. It, it certainly built up a lot more than it was before over the last couple of years. I don't know the exact count of the. Yeah, the and, amount and, of and I just there. asked that because if I had to go through that intersection every time I was going back to my house. I mean, I know, I know you're crippled by certain constraints, mm -hmm. I understand that, but I don't know, that, that, would, be, that would be very bad. It, it, it could take you 30 minutes sometimes to get to do that maneuver, well, I would we, guess. Well, we certainly hope not. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a long route. To um, but, but anyway, anyway and, I, and, I know, and, and I know it's for the greater good. Sometimes some people are gonna be inconvenienced, but th they would really be inconvenienced, and I'm a realtor, and you know, that could affect value there. Yeah. Yeah, and that was some of the same concerns that, that we noticed when we started looking at it in you know, greater detail also. Um, so then looking at the, oops, sorry, I'm going backwards now. Looking at the south side, uh, we simulated access to the Cambridge Cove um, complex. 
So if you're going westbound uh, with a single point urban interchange, uh, you still do have to go for, further west in order to do and then make that U-turn to access Cambridge Cove. Again, this is because you have an overpass and you physically just can't make a left um, underneath it. Right. With the parallel flow intersection, uh, because that one does not involve an overpass, you actually can make that left turn into Cambridge Cove. So it does make that access more direct and more similar to what it is today. And then alternative three, uh, with a continuous flow intersection, that one does have an overpass, so you run into the same issue. So access is modified both based on whether it has an overpass or not, and also whether it has displaced lefts or not. So it's kind of, you know, um, you know, it's pros and cons to each concept. And then the railroad conflicts, uh, so this one we, we have on the, on the count of there the amount of um, just overall movements that will conflict with the rail line, so it's not necessarily a lane count. So you have, say for instance, with the right turn, with eastbound making the right turn, uh, you have uh, dual rights there, um, but we only count it as one because we're counting just a one movement. So, it's, so five total movements overall would intersect uh, with the railroad crossing there for alternative number one. Alternative number two, uh, would have six uh, locations where you'd have those conflicts. And then alternative number three uh, has six, uh, six just like alternative number two, uh, but you can see at the <coughs> bottom is a little bit a little bit offset. So still at the same intersection, but it's offset from that intersection. So we'd have to coordinate with uh, CSX to make sure that the, that whatever design we move forward <coughs> with is acceptable um, to them. So given all those different factors, uh, we believe that the preferred alternative is, the preferred alternative that we've selected is the alternative number one, which is single point urban interchange. This is not an, an easy decision for us at all. Uh, we're engineers, we like to use the numbers uh, as much as possible, but when you really look at the context of this intersection, the urban environment, the growing environment, um, the residents being built on the west end, the businesses in the different corners, uh, we, we do feel like the single point urban interchange is the best one for this intersection. Um, another thing to note, uh, so we're progressing with the pd &E study, and so the substantive alternative is still the single point urban interchange, but one option we want to just look at, um, j you know, just so we covered all our bases, is looking at what if we elevated 41 over 54 instead of 54 over 41. This is not going to uh, slow down the study at all, we just want to just look at it internally. So we're going to have that going parallel, um, so still the same single point urban interchange, but just looking at, 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 at how that would be if we did 41 over 54. Uh, but we're still gonna take one alternative to the public hearing, so once we go through that prelim preliminary analysis, we can come back to the board to present our findings. Mr. Chairman? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, on the residences, you know, Cambridge Cove, Devonwood Oak, mm -hmm. does it matter on their access if you have one going, because I, I, I always like to cross over, crossing over 54 over to 41, I thought it would simplify the rail. But as I look at the difference, what, what affects these neighborhoods, and I think there would be a dramatic effect on pricing for those. Does it matter if it was north-south? Does it make it any better for the residents to access their properties? It would. It, it, if it's north-south, um, so, so the railroad is kind, kind of limits, uh, it, it's kind of limited factor on the west side. So the railroad's here, then the right-of-way um, expansion would go then to the east, um, just based on the limits of the railroad. So that would then remove kind of the concerns with access to the properties west because okay. those would remain the same. Of course, you, then you have more right of way impacts just on the east side of the project. Have you looked at that study? So, 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 so because, we, because we're only kind of preliminary looking at the north-south, mm -hmm. um, we haven't analyzed the access to all the properties on the east side yet. We still need to kind of develop the concept and, and look at it. Mm -hmm. um, but because you don't have a physical overpass there, all the impacts because of the overpass would pretty much be taken away. So if the overpass goes on 41 instead of 54, um, all the impacts, uh, all the left turns that were limited um, because of the overpass, then you could, you'd be able to make those. Um, now, if you have a displaced left, then those impacts would largely remain the same. So it's, it's, it's kind of like hit or miss depending on, on what, what was actually causing the impact. So impacts caused from the overpass would be eliminated by doing north-south, okay. um, but because of this place left, so those impacts would still remain just because of the nature and the design of the intersection. Thank Question. You. Thank you. So the businesses, you know, Timbits Lover and the folks at Pump Road, if there's a, what'd you call it, a free flow, 50, 54? Yes, sir. With that, and those are commercial businesses, with the volume of, of traffic and the type of vehicles that are coming in and out of there, 
the red lights allow those you know braking traffic to allow folks to get out hang a right i guess it'd be going west and getting that turn lane loop around if they have to come east is there any i didn't see any opportunity for traffic to to, to have a, a slow down period that way the folks operating on that corner can get in and out that's safely unless i missed it i'm sorry i missed the beginning uh, of your statement so so, you so what corner are you are you looking at the i guess it would be the northwest corner where timbits oh, yes. slumber and hunt road okay with those with the businesses that are there along hunt road those are commercial businesses um and right now with the red lights there it gives yeah. them a break so they can jump out come down and you know, hang go west and then get in the turn lane loop around and get back if they have to go east or go southbound or or northbound okay so i didn't see i may have missed it but i didn't see where there might have you know not making it worse for those guys oh that are okay there. okay so, so tippets have to if they, if they want to go eastbound how can they go right west? are the folks they, coming they out of hunt, uh, gotcha. out of hunt road yes sir. they're also because then the sod farm yeah. is right next to them yes so so, so with, with that overpass and, and, now granted from a pd concept um it, it's a lot more kind of um uh less less defined than like a design that actual physical design so when we get designed we can actually look at opportunities where we could kind of make some improvements <laughs> to to make some more turnarounds but 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 you are correct it, it would be with the current design that we have, it would be it would limit hunt uh, vehicles come from hunt and also from Tibbets. They'd have to go west and then do U-turn. Yeah, um, because there's red lights there now, it allows a few second gap where they can zip out, jump three lanes, hit their turn lane if they need to. With it being free say. flow, oh, it's oh, going okay. to shorten okay, that window, and they're going to be rolling the dice even oh. more to get out and get across. So that's my point to this design. So I just wanted gotcha. to share that thought. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And all the designs are are, are um, signal controlled, so it's, it's, so the signal would still provide gaps um, for all designs. Uh, question. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> if in the future we do have a CSX or, or a commuter rail line, would fifty four and forty one be a park and ride? A good place for a park and ride, and would this allow for that? Um, where, where? I don't think it precludes tibbets, it from happening. The tibet, the tibet's location. Oh, I, I can't really speak speak to that effectiveness as a park and ride, but but but, but it doesn't preclude rail um, traffic through through here at all. Well, I mean, a trap. You have to. It has to stop somewhere so people can get on it. So I always envisioned 54 and 41 area to be a major commuter mm -hmm. stop if we do get a commuter line. Makes sense. Which one of these plans would allow for that to happen? The best? Uh, so I think um, that kind of ties into some part of the business access that we're looking at. You know, I, how would you access those four quadrants? And this, that's kind of what led us also to pick and select an alternative one because a more conventional type of intersection it makes it a lot easier for folks to kind of get to that corner. While, um, the, while the example I gave was on the northeast, it's pretty, it pretty much tracks the same thing for the northwest corner also. Um, in that access in it, it may, having the displaced left, so alternatives two and three, would force folks to do U-turns and access it in, in a more kind of circuitous route. So I think as far as, so if you had a park and ride at really any one of those corners, um, the easiest one to access would be alternative one. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. what's the plan for the Tibbetts parcel right now? So, so with alternative one, it would impact that Tibbetts parcel, um, which would um, which it would impact their business and likely cause um, a relocation. So, let me go back to that. They, they, they are aware of that. They've known that for years. So, yeah. So, so we do have proposed on on alternative one as a relocation. I understand. What I'm saying is, what's going to happen with the land itself, though? Oh, the land? Oh, 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 sorry, land itself. So, so in a relocation, the department would then own it, but you know, um, remnant parcels are available to go back on the market, or it could potentially be used by, you know, the, the department or or other state agencies. So, to Commissioner Starkey's comments, 
would that work for a parking right there? Oh, um, I just, do you want to chime in on that? I, I, I just don't want to give you all the wrong answers. <laughs> So we'd have to do a different study as to whether that would be a feasible park and ride. But if you're asking about what could we, could we use that for a park and ride, if it was feasible, the answer is yes. That that property could be used for many public uses. It would just need we need to actually study whether that's a viable spot for a park and ride. But that's just a little bit of a different study. But as far as the property being used for that, it could be used for that. I mean, it would seem to me if we're going to do that, and let's say that would for long term to think that way. We're going to probably want to put an overpass from the other side of the street where people might even be parking right in there, mm -hmm. be able to walk across to go in case it needed more capacity. Yeah. There looks like a lot of capacity over there as well to just make it safer to make that cross as well. Mm -hmm. Be across 41? Yeah, across 41 from. Yeah. Would, would that be a study you need to do now to anticipate that if that does happen in the future? For, for a pedestrian overpass? Yeah, or for the commuter. So, so park and ride. So, so for the park and ride, that would that that's kind of out of the scope of, of, of the of, of this PD E for this intersection. Mm -hmm. the, um, that that's kind of better handled by by a separate like transit study. Um, but for a pedestrian overpass, um, yeah, yeah, we can incorporate that into the the, the PD E or into the design. It just um, when we start looking at transit and we start looking at using probably federal money to acquire lands for different purposes. We'd have to look at it from a different perspective. We wouldn't necessarily use highway funds to fund a commuter rail improvement. But I think the commuter rail process as it goes forward will look at those sorts of things. And we're still far enough out that we don't have to make that decision today. But it's something we can consider. And you know, one thing just for a little bit of context, and uh, you know, I, I kind of anticipated that uh, Mr. Parsons would come in here today not happy. Um, he's a smart guy. I, I give him a lot of credit for his, he invented a concept and in a, in a sterile computerized model environment, it looks like it could work in some ways, but it's never been used anywhere. And when you look at how drivers would have to navigate and pedestrians would have to navigate, you're coming from all kinds of different directions. It would be potentially very confusing. It could cause a lot of problems. And we just didn't think this was the right environment to try out a brand new concept. If it failed, it would fail spectacularly. We know that the other concepts have worked. They know that we know that they work other places in similar environments. So, um, that was another factor in ours is it's not like we can go and see how did this work somewhere else? Did it work in a very large intersection? Perhaps someday they'll try it out at a smaller intersection that's not quite as, as busy, but um, just wasn't the right environment, to be honest. That was probably a big factor you don't see in the numbers, but it's never been used uh, anywhere. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? You know, and, and Secretary Gwynn, I, I appreciate you're willing to take a look at things creatively to try to make it happen. When we did look at the diverging diamond, we actually had a good situation to go look at to go see how it worked. Still not sure how it actually works, but it works fantastic, right? <laughs> it's weird. That's I mean, it's, it's, it's tremendous how it works. And I think the rail line here would actually take that away from even working there anyway. But um, I, I agree with you. I think, I think the overpass one way or the other, look at it, and, and I think we we'll probably need more information to find out which is the best way to way the north south whatever to look at those impacts for the residents that own property in there that we don't want to impact we want to minimize the impact we can but um i'm, I'm comfortable seeing one way or the other the overpass to, to work as well yeah and that's what we'll look at the next step okay right. uh, can i ask you a question yes ma'am um does this diagram that you have here contemplate your Mitigation ponds? Yeah. No, no, the ponds are not shown um, in, in this example. How close? How close do those have to be to the actual intersection? It really depends. It, it, it's not necessarily based on the proximity to the intersection. More to pay, more based on like what drainage basin is actually working from, and how easily can we get that water from the road to that drainage. Um, to, to, to a pond within that drainage basin, so. Okay. Yeah. Drainage, is, drainage is fun. 
Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. No well, uh, when, when do we pull the trigger? I'm oh, sorry. So, 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 so we're negotiating the contract now to execute the um, pd &E. um, We're looking to have a public hearing uh, earliest end of this year or latest uh, early uh, 24. Uh, right now, um, we are, we're still seeking right now uh, because because it's part of our sys network. Uh, we do have funding, but it's out in 2030. But there, you know, we are looking at opportunities to advance that sooner. So, so. Um, I looked at the uh, infrastructure bill language, not, you know, I'm not an expert in that, but um, I do know, and this was a conversation I have with Carl, we have applied, we, we, have, we have not applied for a penny of it, it's a record amount of money. Um, is this something that we could apply for to help off, offset the cost? The answer is yes. So, yeah, we could have, I mean, we could have done that already, but we're going to miss this year, right? It's February 28th or something. Yeah, I, I will say, though, your, your best bet is for the PD&E to be either complete or near complete uh, for that process because there, there are some components of the application that, that you're going to want to have those answers uh, to tell that story. And that's something that if you do choose to proceed with a grant application because this is a state road, we can actually assist uh, with the application process. And we've been fairly successful lately. I think we've we've been two for two or two for three in the past several years, uh, uh, FDOT for our grant applications here in District 7, so. So um, the other ones, when I look through the list of eligible projects, uh, bike trails and pedestrian overpasses are also allowed. Um, I think someone had thought maybe those on state roads were not allowed, but when I asked our federal lobbyists, they said, yes, they were. So how, how I think, we, well, I think in the upcoming year, we should be planning on applying for something, and someone uh, smarter than us here needs to tell us which ones are the best ones that we may have the most success for in, in winning, and you know, try and take some of this burden off the local taxpayers. When I see Hillsborough and Pinellas, and I, I have it teed up for the next board meeting to show you all the winners from last year's race grants and what they were building. And it's all the stuff we talked about today, transportation, yeah. safety, overpasses, trails, improving movement or whatever. And they seem to be around $24 million. Yep. Seems to kind of be the average amount they're winning. Yeah, so the raise, uh, if I remember, raise was capped at 25. Oh, and then there's Infra, which is a, a larger program. And there, there's a bunch of them, but I'll offer this to you. We've offered this. We actually had a meeting with all of our uh, local counties, MPOs. Uh, we will assist you uh, with grant applications if it's on the state network. Uh, there's a bunch of different grant programs and, and we've developed a pretty robust system to track them and help you out with writing it and that's a service that FDOT provides uh, for free. So, uh, so City of Tampa, Hillsborough, Wait, Hillsborough County, Pinellas County, they've taken us up on that. Uh, we've, we've assisted them, uh, we've assisted the cities. Um, uh, uh, but I have to stop you, why weren't we doing that? If you, d if you provide that service, why won't uh, we take advantage of it? I think that's a question maybe I would ask back to Pasco County. Okay. Because um, that you is something. Ask that question. Don't look at me. I'm the new guy. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, I, I, I think I, I'll just say this. The good thing is I don't dwell on the past. I look at the future. So the future is if, if you want to do it, you want to talk about it, we're Let's open talk. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Apple. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? No. <laughs> just just like, going along as you go through this process, just I think it goes without being said, but I'm not sure what your method is to keeping the residents in the, you know, apprised of what's going on here, but I certainly hope that that's happening and communication is is frequent and in great detail and very clear for those folks to understand because they're already frustrated enough and uh, really don't want to see them even more frustrated if we can avoid it. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, these items are for information only, so no action is required. Um, we <laughs> so we're on number two, Mr. Carl, we talk about Conceptual Road from 41 Connors and Boulevard to I-75. Thank you. Uh, so this is exactly as titled. 
Uh, the concept being to improve the east-west movements across Pasco County. Uh, currently, we have US, uh, we have State Route 52, we have 54, uh, but there's a large length of distance between those two facilities. And the concept here is to look at a mid-county east-west connection. And I do believe there's a map with this. Uh, so noting the current terminus on this map of where Ridge Road meets US 41. And we do have an intersection at I-75 and Overpass Road. It would seem logical to try to tie into that. And exploring the possibility of connecting those two points in some form or fashion. <clears throat> and it's a conceptual idea. It has not been studied in our long-range plan or in any studies. But it was something to be brought before you for discussion and direction. Mr. Chairman? Commissioner? So the, the reason, and Carl, thank you very much for making this an agenda item. Um, the reason I brought this up, we had recently had approved at the Board of County Commissioners a study running from overpass all the way to 301. And I says, well, if we're going to study that, I think we should take a look at the study all the way from Ridge Road at the overpass interchange all the way going back the other way. Um, I will tell you that the traffic reliever that we've already felt from the Ridge Road extension uh, running from, let's call it Moon Lake, uh, to Sun Coast has been great, great access. Sun Lake's coming up, I think, this summer. And then 41, uh, 2025, I believe it is. And if we could start looking now and, and you know, let's, let's investigate it, see if it works. Um, I think you put that other road going across this whole county, it's going to really help us long term in our transportation issues. And this is not a brand new idea. When I was first elected, this was one of the things we talked about, and we had to decide whether we keep fighting with the Army Corps to go get Ridge Road extension. I says, well, why aren't we looking to go all the way to 75? And they said, look, let's just get to 41 first, get that approved, then we can go look at it. Well, we've done that. Uh, matter of fact, I think the last court hearing that we just had, we just won in our favor, so um, the road's gonna be done. I think it's wise to go take a look at it now Let's get started on it and just see, see where it takes us. Um, so I don't know if anyone studied this, but, you know, like Starkey Wellfield, our, our family had restrictions on that land when um, they donated some to Swift Mud and sold some that had to stay in its natural state. <coughs> uh, and Saranova was bought for mitigation for the Sun Coast. Um, and, and the last, and, and then we also sold 4,000 acres of our ranch to the state for mitigation for the site coast. Um, that, that piece of land was, was that, I don't know who bought it, who owned it, was it Hillsborough County? Or, it may still own it, who, who owns it? That is my understanding. I cannot confirm that, but yes, it is, um, there are some well fields in there. And so, is labeled the Cypress Creek Preserve. Okay, so it might it I don't so I don't know what kind of restrictions are on there, but but you know the well fields would still function if there was a real road going through there. And the well fields, the area right around the well the well heads is owned by Tampa Bay Water. Um, but you know, I just don't know what, what we'd be up against going through there. There it I mean the road goes through, it's a service road right now that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. goes from one end to the other, it's a gravel road. Uh, I just have no history of how that came into being, who owns it. I don't remember. Probably I was on the Swiftboard board. I should remember. You, you remember, Seth? Fre fresh. Fresh. Okay. So, so I, so obviously this goes through the heart of my district and the property that's owned through here is a kind of a conglomerate of Tampa Bay Water, Swift Mud owns parcels, and then there's some private entities that own uh, owned through here and then obviously kind of <clears throat> as it gets further east there's conservation easement with one family and then a little bit further south Quell Hollow and uh, you know connects into the overpass area I just it's such a that area is such a significant area for our water supply and water quality that you know studying it's one thing but I think we really, really need to understand the impacts if we go disturbing that because that water supplies obviously, you know, the greater Tampa Bay area with an essential resource. So um, it's a very environmentally sensitive place. Uh, it's a very 
pristine piece of nature. So um, it's, I just want that on, on the record as we, as we look at this. Mr. Chairman? Sure. And you know, I, I respect what it is. Um, I look at the Suncoast Parkway running right through the heart of Saranova. And <clears throat> keep in mind too, when we did that, there was, I think 6,500 homes were gonna be built, 200 acre, acre, 250 acres of like commercial development, 250 more acres of uh, other retail was gonna be put in, and all that got extinguished going through. Um, had we not, had we classified that area going for Ridge Road different from an Arnie uh, at that point in time, just the way we did Suncoast, we would have been through the process a lot quicker. I don't know what the limitations are. I don't know exactly all the effects, but I will say, I think that we built that Ridge Road extension, environmentally very sensitive, protected everything down below it. Um, I, it may just be a two lane road, it may be a four lane road, whatever it may be, but if it gets us across there and we don't know until we study it to what's, what, what even the ramifications are, et cetera. But it's such a critical piece of us going east-west would, I, I think, I think it's worth a look. Now, that, Especially now that overpass interchange has been built. Yeah. That's a $55 million product that we've got for infrastructure, but only goes onto one side. It's gonna go all the way 301. I think we need to look at both sides. I don't disagree with looking at a road concept. My concern is once the road's there and then limits are pushed and then what the, you know, for developments and, and what, what comes along with it. Uh, I think that we just need to be very measured as we go through this process and really understand the impacts of what we're, of, this, of these properties and, and building on them. And, and, you know, I'm not looking to have any anything more than just the roadway to go through. So just like we extinguished everything in Saranova, <coughs> we can do the same thing along this way as well. As a matter of fact, you might even find some development pressures that people on Old Pasco Road don't want to see anyway. It might help us buy the land that's there and extinguish that as well. So it could be long-term benefits for many different things. Again, if we don't look at it, we'll never know. Right. And as long as, as, long as Ridge Road took, we didn't rush that one too quick. Yeah, <laughs> a couple of generations. I don't, I don't expect this a yeah. lot different. A couple generations. <laughs> So we're looking for a blessing here? Is that what we're doing? What's our next step, Carmen? So the next step would be to logically uh, look at this in the screening of projects that would be conducted with the long-range transportation plan. That product is due in December of 2024, and it takes a fair amount of time to compose one. So the suggestion would be that as we put in projects to the long-range plan, we take them through a high-level screening and then a more detailed screening to do a screening of this so that we have a better sense of what exactly we would be facing in terms of any challenges such as you're identifying <clears throat> here. I think that will give you a clearer picture of what this facility may offer for challenges and opportunities and it will allow you to have a more informed choice as we look at going forward or not going forward if that is the alternative we choose. Mr. So Chair. that is the staff recommendation. Okay. And, and I'm like uh, Commissioner Waitman, I'm very sensitive to the land there and what it does. We can study that and if we can uh, just minimize any impact to it um, because we, we don't need sprawling development along a road. But if we need to move traffic, that's a different, that's a different issue. When, when we <clears throat> set up the Ridge Road extension from part of 41, we actually had the thing designed a couple of years earlier to go. Uh, Moffitt was coming in and we then just gave them the cuts that they needed and went with that. Um, we didn't have to, we could have kept the road going just the way it was, but we thought that was important enough. Sure. We can set the same type of things here. And I will tell you, the high bridges all the way through, I mean, that road cost went dramatically higher, right. but with everything elevated up over, you weren't cutting through the wetland, you were building bridges across it. And I'll tell you, if you haven't driven it, yeah. Go take a drive. It was a really fantastic yeah. road. And it's the, well the environment is, is all protected all the way around it. But it just saves so many trips. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, we're going to go spend how much money on this interchange of 54 and 41? Because you, right. you got all that development. You can relieve so much. And I, and I especially want to make sure as we build it, we just make sure we extinguish any turns off. Just help us get from point A to point B. No cuts. I'm good with that. Right. Okay, while he's throwing that one on the table, I got one. <laughs> um, 
It also involves the world. So if you were to, can, are they able to put up Google Earth or map, maps or anything on that? If you uh, could pull, pull up um, Sierra Pines and Commissioner Bradford's district up here yeah. today. I want to show you another possible connection that I've been looking at. It's to the west on 54. So if you go to Suncoast on 54 area, you'll see it. Whoa. Okay. Okay, um, uh, you went a little too far to go. Well, yeah, blow up that area where you see some like Boulevard. And, okay, and then go um, push that up a little bit north. So you see Pinal, uh, Hillsborough County behind it. All right, do you see um, Permit Place? Yes, starting here and here. Because this is the corner preserve. Yeah, and then if you, can you go up a little north? A north Keep State Road 54 in there, yeah. And, but oh, you, you only can yeah, get. Oh no, don't yeah, don't go on past the map, map please. Go on, because um, I need you to get to Hillsborough County. And past the map, or only has past the. Out of country. So uh, th th this is a well field that uh, is owned by St. Petersburg, City of St. Pete, and. Um, uh, they had a breach in their berm and had to come up and fix it that was flooding into some Sierra Pines. And um, the wellheads are in, owned by Tampa Bay Water, but the land, I believe, is owned by City St. Pete. And, um, no, that's not it. What are we doing? I think he's working on pulling oh. it up. So there is a road in Sierra Pines called Sierra Pines Boulevard that is actually mostly a Hillsborough County road. And they, they, they're not, they don't maintain it though, sadly. It's, it is really in bad shape. But you can see that there is a road going next to it. And I think it was called Permit Place Road. Okay, you gotta see. okay, yeah. But you need to go out just a little bit. And a little bit more. So, uh, so that well field, that area uh, is, is uh it's hard to do without the cursor do you see where there's two parallel can you push that up so you can see hillsborough county that's county line road or lutz lake fern or i think that's lutz lake fern down at the bottom there but you can see where we can connect 54 have another connector to 54 going north south there you could come up on the already um built road of um Sierra Pines Boulevard, and then cross over there to the right, and then go up north on that service road that's it's already paved, that is going to the well. You know, it just got, it's a road that goes through that property. Um, so I wondered if that is another good north-south connector, because the more we can connect to the south, the less pressure we take off everything else. Yeah. So um, there's very few houses that front, if any. There may be one or two on Sierra Pines Boulevard. So I, I, I'd like to throw that out there for discussion, for you guys to look at. Is there a laser yeah. pointer that you can so, Is that, that like out? from the Cheval straight up? Is that the road um, you're talking about? That's not the best map, so I don't, I don't know what to tell you there. Ah, well, Commissioner Starkey? Yeah? What, what I had done was I asked him about this. He put an agenda item together. We yeah, just asked him to bring an agenda item and just let him bring it back, just like we did this one here. Yeah, so take a look at that and uh, bring it back for future discussion. Yeah. Okay, and we'd I can be show happy. It to you guys on my iPad. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got one? Okay. okay, yeah. So, okay. This is Sierra Pines, and then there's another neighbor in here, Meadow something. This is one of their entrances. And then this is what I'm talking about. It comes here. So this down. road exists. Yeah. It's a it exists for the access to this well field. Sierra Pines Boulevard. Can you zoom in here? Zoom in a little more. And a little more. So you see uh, 
Sierra Pines Boulevard is here, and the St. Pete Road is here. And somewhere, I'm sorry, uh, can you go down a little bit? This is Sierra Pines Boulevard right here. Okay. And keep going down. We're going to start at this road on the south. And someone tell me, is this Loose Lake Fern or County Line Road? Loose Lake. Okay, Loose Lake. So this is Sierra Pines Boulevard. And somewhere, this is Hillsborough County until it gets to somewhere up here. This is the access road, one of the roads that they use to get into that wall field. They're, they're, they're parallel. Can you work your way north now? So I would propose coming up Sierra Pines Boulevard to right here and going over here and getting on that road and keep going north. 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 And then there's 54. With the, like with the local, so we need cooperation, though. Huh? We need cooperation with Hillsborough, though. But now it's Saint, City of Saint Petersburg. City of Saint Pete. And uh, and that kind of, road's already built. That's in Hillsborough. Right, right. <laughs> they just have to maintain it better. Right. So you need City of Saint Pete if they own the land, but you're also going to need who? Hillsborough. Who? Is it? Is yeah. this well field? Uh, this land is this in Hillsborough or Pinellas? It's owned by the City of Saint Petersburg. You know how that happens. No, I know how they bought the land. I'm, what I'm saying is, though, is what county is it in? Because I'm thinking it's you got to work with county. it. It's our county. That's all our county, all the way down where you're trying to connect? Um, the, uh, well, where, where it connects to Loops Lake Fern is Hillsborough. Right, so you're going to need Hillsborough County. To no, because we would come up, we would come up Sierra Pines Boulevard, which is already built. So, so where, we, where we connect is all the Pinellas County. I mean, Pasco County. Because I would... I would say don't build another road. Use the one that's already there. Okay. Hillsborough County would need to <coughs> pave it because it's yeah. full of potholes. All right, then let's bring it back. Yeah. yeah. Let's take a right, look. Take a look at it, Mr. Carl, and bring it back. Be yeah, happy to do Thank so. You. And Carl, this this says it's informational only. Do we so we don't need to do anything? You're just gonna then bring something back to us. I'm just was looking on. to okay. share this with everyone and then okay. uh, receive feedback as to how we would then approach this going forward. Uh, with the staff recommendation of obviously looking at this as part of the long range plan. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, if the chair would indulge me, I would like to engage in a little bit of housekeeping, please. Yes. At our last meeting, we assigned the role of representing this body to the Metropolitan Planning Advisory Council, uh, which is the statewide association of MPOs, to the chair, is how it was worded in the motion. And I wanted to ask if it was the intention to have the chair or the former chair uh, represent this body to the statewide association. And so as a matter of I remember it as the chair. <laughs> the chair. <laughs> the well, chair. I know that. that is why I want to have a clarification so that if there is an adjustment, we have to notify MPOAC that we've had a change in our roster. Okay. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we had clarity on that so there was not any this is not a book. All right. I was pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> so would you be willing to serve? That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will let them know to update their website, and um, we'll get you the meeting information for that. It meets okay. quarterly, so it's not a big lift. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I wanted to bring up. All right. Um, so we're down to other business. Looks like we have some MPO birthdays in the house. Yes. Uh, Scott Ferry. Tina Russo and Lori Shadiger. I know I just messed that up badly, that last name. But this was a happy birthday. Oh, wow. happy, happy birthday. birthday. Um, is there any other, anything else that we need to discuss for the business? Okay. Well, I, I, I did have a, a conversation with the secretary before we started about the um, importation of Kogan grass all along 52. So I think we're going to look at it. And, um, I, I have suggested that we talk to uh, the new agriculture commissioner about having Pasco County be a pilot program for the eradication of Kogan grass along public roads. Um, so I think we should be talking to him about that and help uh, defray the cost. But I, y'all have seen what's happened in Hernando County on their roads, and um, Hernando uh, Kogan grass is one of the I think the top three most invasive plants in the world. And so we don't want it to spread all over like it, has, well, it is doing up there. So um, 
that would be a good program to talk to both of them. But their contractor has brought it in and filtered, which is how it came into my neighborhood, Aristida, and it's spreading. Because every time you mow it, it spreads. You can't kill it that yeah, way. Yeah, you brought it. We'll take a look at it. I'm not familiar with it personally, but we'll take a look at it. <coughs> yeah. I did want to mention just for close, you should have gotten a um, hold of date for next Friday. We're looking at doing the uh, ribbon cutting for State Road 52 opening. If you haven't, your office should have received it. Okay. But uh, it'll be, I believe, 10 o'clock in the morning, February 17th. Um, and uh, if you haven't already gotten a hold of date, you'll get a formal invitation probably today. We did invite the governor. Don't know if he's going to be able to come or not, but uh, it was invited. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. It'll be opening up the whole route, one lane in each direction. Uh, and then uh, later in the year, we'll open both lanes. But uh, be a nice, nice uh, opportunity to showcase that project. It was a good partnership between the county and the state. And uh, similar to State Road 56, we'll have another uh, connection all the way across. Thank you. And we never did celebrate, have a big celebration for Rich Road. We were going to have Congressman Bill Rackus, and maybe the next section. Uh, Mr. Chairman? So, I, and I think when we open the next section, maybe it's to Sun Lake at Ridge Road, we should make it a big deal. So maybe that's the opportunity. We, we our previous administrator, I, I don't think handled that the way he should have. That should have been a big deal. <coughs> to, get go. To, to get a call a half an hour before that thing was going to get open was not right. And frankly, the overpass virtual, I've had a discussion. I didn't like that done, the way that was done either. So uh, I was very happy to know that you're going to do the opening for this and I'm glad you're inviting the governor I hope you're inviting all the state reps as well all the state representatives yeah. or obviously Perfect. the counties cities uh, and uh, I believe the save the date went out earlier this week and I think the formal announcement or invitation with the directions of where to go and all will be coming out if it hasn't already in the next yeah. day or so I do have it on my calendar I just check so thank you for that and, and I know you'll do a great job with us so we appreciate you thanks all for right. all your help thank you thank you secretary anything else Go once, go on twice. Most of you adjourn. Most to adjourn. Thank you. Good job. Oh, Good wow. job. Yeah. You're the man.